If you have your Bibles, uh, open up to Genesis. Uh, we're gonna, I'm just going to recap real quickly before we press on. Uh, I'm actually going to... Um, I'm going to kind of repeat what we did last week. Um, I got a little bit further into the message last week than I was expecting, and I didn't have the notes for what I did last week. So I've got the notes today so I can actually give you chapter and verse for the scriptures that I'm referring to. Um, we are in our series on the family. And uh, we have a lot of presupposed ideas as to what a family should look like. Okay? Um, and our ideas are different than other places in the world. Our ideas are probably different from each other. One of the greatest miracles that God does in the world is when he brings a husband with all of his background and a wife with all of her background and he brings them together to create a new background. And Christy and I are living testimony to this. Um, I, I came from a, a radically different background than she did. And we spent um, quite a bit of time talking before we got married about how we were going to raise our family and, and what the expectations were going to be. And, and, and then we got married and had kids and none of that lasted. <laughs> uh, because when you have kids, their greatest joy in life, and I think their sole purpose is to remind you um, that, that man makes his plans and God laughs. Okay? Um, but we want to talk about what Scripture has to say about the family. Okay? Uh, last week, and, and a little bit the week before, uh, I kind of intro this with uh, Genesis chapter 1. God creates on day six. He creates man. Uh, and then in, in chapter two, Moses, who is writing this, he backs up into chapter one, into the creation story, and he gives us some specific details of things that are happening in the creation story. Now, I'm not here to debate with you uh, how long this took, when, when this actually happened, what was going on. I'm, I'm just here to read the scripture and, and shed light on what's happening in the creation and the institution of a family. Okay? So uh, we look at uh, Genesis 1, 26 through 31. Go ahead and, and go to the next one. And we see that God gave direction to mankind. And the first thing that he said is, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay. The, the next thing that he said is to subdue it, the earth, not the family and the multiplying, the earth, and to have dominion over it. And we, we talked a little bit about in the Hebrew, this when we hear subdue, we almost always picture it with a negative connotation. We always look at it as somebody standing over the top of the other and, and pointing <coughs> fingers and, and anger and hostility. But the, the Greek idea for this, or I'm sorry, the Hebrew idea for this is actually to take care of, to be a steward, to be a, a husband. Um, and when uh, we look at all of Scripture, this becomes very clear because Jesus multiple times in, in his parables he talks about being good stewards, and, and he tells us about bad stewards. And he talks about how this, this whole thing is supposed to work. When God created man, he created him with purpose. And the first directive that he gives them is be fruitful and multiply, have dominion over the earth. Over, and notice he says over the earth. Not over all of creation, and certainly not over God. Okay? Man is put in charge of, of the earth and all of the animals that are in it, okay? and by extension, the plants. Um, so, have dominion over the creation to be the husband, the steward, the caretaker, um, the ambassador, if you will, from God to the creation. Okay. So, then we jumped ahead to Genesis chapter 2. And we get a, a, an in-depth survey 
of what was happening on day six. Okay, and there's a number of points that we, we drew out. Uh, so Genesis 2, 15 through 25, I'm not going to reread these. I read them last week and the week before. I'll leave it to you guys to reread them. Uh, but there's a number of points that we draw out of this. Okay, so the first thing is God creates Adam from the dust. Okay, God used his creation to create Adam. And then he gave him the breath of life. And, and he became a living being. Now, uh, one thing that's not up there that we need to reiterate, and this is something that we, I think we fail to grasp in great depth. Of all of creation, only mankind is created in the image of God. Okay? Imago Dei. Now, that, that's not to say that, you know, God has a, a form like us because God is spirit. Okay, Now, God did take upon himself a form like us when he became man and, and the man Jesus Christ. Okay, But the nature of God, when he says, let us make man in our image, it's not talking about, about, about the physical being of mankind. Okay, He's talking about what separates us from the rest of creation. Okay? And, and we've dug into this before, and, and there's a lot of questions as to what exactly that means and what exactly is it that separates us out. Uh, is it our intelligence? Is it our opposable thumbs? Uh, is, it, is it the fact that we can learn something and then completely do the opposite of what we learned? Um, you know, we, we, we've got a lot of things here. Um, so I, but that's not what I want to get into today. So uh, God creates Eden, and... He places Adam in Eden to work. Okay? Man was created to accomplish the purposes that God set for him. That's one of the things that we fail to see. And, and um, Ephesians chapter 2, I believe it's uh, verse 9 and 10, it talks about how we are saved because of God's grace and faith, they combine to salvation, <clears throat> but it's not of works, lest any man would boast. Okay, but then, in, in verse 10 it says, uh, then we are to do the works that God prepared beforehand for us to do. See, see the, the whole point of salvation is to take what sin corrupted and twisted and warped and to untangle that, that knot and, and make it back to the way that God intended it. Okay? So, man is put to work in the garden, uh, and, and actually when you read it in context, it's not just the garden, he's, he's ultimately going to be in charge of the entire <coughs> earth. So, uh, he was responsible to name all of the animals. Um, we, we came up with uh, uh, names for some of the animals. There was Bill, and, and there was Davy, and and there was Jerry, and, and but I, I don't know what the names were. Okay, scripture doesn't give them to us. So uh, Adam, one of his tasks was to name the animals. He, God would bring the animals to him and he'd go, donkey, <laughs> monkey, gorilla, because a gorilla is not a monkey, because it doesn't have a tail. <laughs> You guys don't watch Veggie Tales, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was completely wasted. Okay. All right. But amongst all the animals, no suitable helper was found. Okay. Uh, I think this is important because I know people that treat their pets with far greater love and compassion than they do their spouses. Okay. So, uh, all of, all of the animals, there was, there was no suitable helper found for Adam. And so, God uses a part of Adam, his rib, to create Eve. Now, Eve, of all of creation, is unique. Because it, it says that out of the dust of the earth he formed man, and actually out of the dust he formed the living animals. But Eve, he formed out of man. She's unique in all of creation. I think that's an awesome testimony to God's creative power. Okay, So in chapter 2, we see these things going into place. Uh, God used a part of Adam to, to make Eve, and, and now there's put to work in the garden. 
and then we get to chapter 3. Now, before we get into chapter 3, actually, yeah, before we get into chapter 3, um, chapter 3 is the downfall. Okay? We know that the serpent came in. We know that he deceived Eve, and she ate of the fruit that God told her, told them, don't eat this. And um, she turned and gave it to Adam, who was there with her. So she failed in her job. He failed in his job. They both ate. Sin came in. And the very warp and woof of creation <clears throat> is twisted. It's tainted. It's corrupted. Okay? Now, we have to understand 1, 2, and 3. Because if we don't understand that God created with a specific intention and a specific purpose, and we don't understand how that was twisted and warped and changed and corrupted, then we, don't, we won't be able to really see things the way they are today and see things the way God wants them to be. We'll start making excuses and we'll start ignoring and overlooking the, the chapters and verses where God is telling us, look, this is how it's supposed to be. Because we'll find them uncomfortable and we won't like them because we are knitted into a cultural idea of the way things should be. All right? So, um, the original family. Observations. It was to be a monogamous relationship. One man, one woman. Okay? One and one, one plus one, makes one. Okay? One and one makes one. God binds them together. Um, Janet, we're gonna, I'm putting the scriptures up for here because I'm going to go through these pretty quick. I just want to hit really quickly some of these passages so you will understand um, where I'm coming from when I say the things that I do. So... Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Okay, now we get the whole one flesh thing, but did you, did you notice the numeric quantity in the, verse, in the verse there? A man, his wife, Man and wife, not plural in either case. And then one plus one, the two become one flesh. Okay, so now let's go forward here. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17. Is that right? Yeah, 17. I put bookmarks in, but half of my bookmarks have slid down. And I can't find them. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 17. Verse 17. Now, before I read this, you need to understand what's going on. Uh, as God has already delivered the children out of Egypt, the children of Israel, and he's brought them through the desert, and they're to the point where they're ready to go in the land, and before they go, Moses has already been told he's not going to go into the land. And so he wants to go over, uh, he wants to reaffirm for them their history and, and their relationship with God and the things that he expects of them. Now, right now, Israel is being led by Moses and Aaron and through a select group of judges that were raised up out of the people. And we see actually for a number of, of chapters in the book and actually a couple books going forward um, this was the way that it was was it was their politics this is how it happened okay they were led by a high priest and they were led by the judges but in uh, chapter 17 we're going to pick up in verse 14 Moses realizes that it's not going to be long 
but eventually they're going to want a king. They're going to want to be just like the, the communities, the, the nationalities around them. So in 14, he, he gives them these directives. He says, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many, excuse me, many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall, not, uh, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Okay, now do you see some strictures here that are being laid into place? The first is he has to be an Israelite. He can't be from another nation. Uh, the second thing is uh, he's, he's not supposed to uh, gather a lot of horses or cause the people of Israel to return to Egypt. And he's not to have many wives. And he shall not acquire a lot of silver and gold. Now, can you think for a moment of a king that violated each of these? Well, actually, David started it. Okay? Um, David, David, you look at the things that he put toward the building of the temple of God, he had incredible wealth. We also know he had numerous wives. Okay? So here we are, second king into it, and they've already violated everything that Moses told them. Okay? So... Uh, the king is directed to not have many wives. Now, so, some of you are going to be saying, but you know, Pastor Glenn, there is not a specific scripture anywhere in there where it says that bigamy or polygamy is wrong. You're right. There's not a single scripture in here that says you should not do this. However, there are numerous scriptures that talk about the husband and wife relationship where it is always referred to in the singular. Single husband, single wife. Okay? You don't look for the ones that say no, 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 no. You look for the ones that say do, 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 do. Okay? Um, law is based on the do's and don'ts, especially the don'ts. Grace is, is based on the do's. Okay? So, we see here in Deuteronomy 17, verse 17, the king is not to have many wives. Uh, let's jump to the New Testament, the book of Mark. Chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. <clears throat> Actually, I'm going to back up uh, verse 2. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? <coughs> he answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. Now look, what does Jesus do here? He goes right back to where we started in Genesis. Okay? He goes right back to the beginning. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And then he quotes the passage we just read. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Okay? So Jesus who is God, and they challenge him on this, he goes back to the original intent, the original design, the original implement, implementation of the institution of the family, and he says, man, white, and the two become one. Now, you know, he goes down further here, and he says, uh, after the two... 
uh, become one flesh. He says, Whatsoever, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. I'm going to pause here for just a second. Okay? Because we had something really special happen here Friday evening. And so I'm, I'm going to embarrass them right now. So Ralph, would you in faith please stand up? Uh, I, I would like to introduce to Jesus Community Church, Mr. and Mrs. Ralph Jacob. They were married on the Go ahead and sit down. Now, uh, I need I need a volunteer. Bench. Come here. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, now let's see. I need two strong men. Let's see. Uh, Dave! You the wrong way. <laughs> oh, no, I need your strength. Okay. I need you to come here because I need you and Ron to help me. Right. Okay, now, would, would you guys acknowledge and admit that Benjamin is one flesh right here? I think so. Yeah? Check his teeth and, you know, his horse. Yeah. Okay, so make that one flesh two flesh. Oh. That's why I asked for a volunteer. Come on, between the two of you, make him, make him two flesh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Give him a good yank. Oh, I like you better than that. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Good enough. Thank you, gentlemen. It seems silly and it's fun to laugh at. But what would happen if they were able to make him to flesh? He'd be damaged at the very least, wouldn't he? And, and quite possibly dead. Right? Okay? When God sees two people united together in the bond of marriage, he doesn't see them as two people anymore. He sees them as one. Okay? And, and a little later on when we get into a little bit more detail about the marriage relationship, we're going to talk about um, these things. We're going to talk about divorce. Okay? And we're just going to, we're going to rest right in Scripture. Okay? Now, I want you to understand, in all of this, whatever is said, we rest in God's grace. Amen? His grace has covered all of our sin. Okay? Wherever we have stumbled, wherever we are in error, His grace covers it. Okay? So when I talk to you and the Word reads, and it's something that might, might kind of stick you, remember that you are under grace. Okay? So, here we go. Jesus said, let's go back to the beginning. The two will become one flesh. Uh, let's jump forward again to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Um, if, if you are ever looking for... Uh, God's insight on marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that's a good place to start. Okay? Um, he writes to the Corinthians, this is Paul writing, he says in verse 1, he says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. Husband, wife, singular. Wife, husband, singular. Okay? You, you guys catching a flow here? Are you catching kind of a, what, what God's intent is for marriage? Uh, let's flip over to 1 Timothy. Chapter 3. Now... These, these next couple of passages, these are specifically talking about the qualifications for a, an elder and the qualifications for a deacon. Okay? And so in, in verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul writes to Timothy. These are called the pastoral letters. Uh, Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Because Paul is teaching them the things they no, need to know to be a successful pastor. Okay? So in verse 1... Uh, Paul says, 
The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Verse 2, he gives the qualifications. Therefore, an overseer, which, by the way, overseer uh, is, is the same office as an elder, okay? Uh, therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, Sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of, me of money. And he goes on through and he talks about how his family should be, um, what his family's qualifications are for him to be an elder. Well, then we get down here to verse 8, and he shifts gears. And, okay, so we have the elders, and now we're going to talk about the deacons. And in verse 8 he says, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. Uh, they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them also be tested first. Then they can serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, uh, not slanderers, uh, but sober-minded, faithful in all the things. Let each deacon be the husband of one wife managing their children and their households well. Now, one of the things that uh, we're, we're going to run into whenever we talk about some of Paul's writings, especially those writings that are uncomfortable for us today, is people are going to say one of two things, and actually one of the, several things. One, that's Paul's opinion. Okay? That's, that's not God talking, that's Paul's opinion. Okay? If that's the case, and this is in here on accident, then how can we trust any of it? Okay. The, the, the root of this thing is that what Paul wrote, he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and God saw fit to put it into a collection of writings that would be passed down through the generations to you and I. Okay. Well, The other thing they're going to say is, Oh, Paul was writing to a specific people or a specific culture. You don't think God knew that? You don't think God was, was capable of inspiring him to write something to a specific people and a specific culture, and yet it bridge not only the years, but the people and the culture? Because if you're going to put limitations of, of man on God's writings, then you've taken God out of the writings. And there are going to be some things in here that are going to step on toes. It should step on your toes. Because every one of us is caught up in sin, and a lot of it we don't even know we're caught in. Okay? That's why we have this. To help point out those areas where we're caught. Alright? So, uh, Titus, uh, he, chapter 1, he says, This is why I left you in Crete. So that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife. And his children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Then he goes on. These are the lists, the qualifications of an elder. Now, now Paul has written it in two letters to two different men who are the second generation of apostles those that were raised up after the disciples and Paul, the next generation, Timothy and Titus, and, and he's telling them, hey, look, in order for this thing to work right, these are the qualifications that have to be in place. The husband of one wife. Okay? Now, you look at the totality of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. There are times when men had more than one wife. There are times when even a woman had more than one husband. Okay? But that is not God's design nor desire. Okay? Because when God created it, he created two separate individuals that would unite to become one flesh. And it's only through the union of the male and the female that the species can be propagated. There's a component part necessary from the female, there's a component part necessary from the male, and the two quite literally become one in the creation of a new life. Okay, So, um, 
monogamous. Second thing we talked about last week, uh, let's go ahead and go to the next thing. The relationship was to be heterosexual. Now we talked about this at length last week, so I'm just going to hit some highlights. Uh, Genesis chapter 19, uh, 1 through 13. Now we, we backed up originally to Genesis uh, 2 because God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Uh, <laughs> He, he created one male and one female and put them together. He didn't create two males nor two females. All right? Okay, my bookmarks are pretty much useless. All right, so um, Genesis chapter 19. This is the story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I just want to kind of point out to you, spend some time and look at this passage, okay? In this passage, uh, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns rose up before God such that he decided to intervene directly, okay? Um, he sent, actually he, being the pre-incarnate Christ, and, and a couple angels came and they spoke with Abraham, and Abraham shared with them, he said, well, you know, what, what if there are 50 righteous people in, in the town? Would you spare it for the sake of the 50 righteous, or would you burn it despite them? And he said, well, for the sake of 50, I, I, won't, I won't destroy the town. And he said, well, if you wouldn't do it for 50, would you do it for 20? And he says, well, for the sake of 20, I, I won't destroy it. And he says, well, what about for 10? Would you destroy it for 10? And he says, okay, if there are 10 righteous people in the city, I will not destroy it. Well, then we see something kind of unique happen because there were three men that came up and only two of them went on down to Sodom and Gomorrah. And they went down and they, they came to the square and they were going to sleep in the square. And uh, Abraham's nephew, Lot, he sees them and, and he says, hey, come, come to my house, be my guest. And they're like, oh, no, we're cool. You know, we, we like to sleep in the square. We're good. He says, no, I, I really think you should come to the house. I, I think you need to come in and, and be my guest. And so they, they agree. They go into his house, and, and uh, they have a meal. And in the course of the night, it says that all of the men, young and old, in the city came, and they accosted Lot, and they required of him to pass the men, the visitors, out of his house that they might rape them. Okay? And Lot actually goes out to talk to the people. And, and this is one of those things that one day I'm going to ask God. I'm going to say, okay, I, don't, I get this part. I don't understand this. Because Lot goes out and he says, no, I, I can't give you these men. They're, they're guests under my roof. Here, take my daughters. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get that. Okay? And that's one of the things I'm going to ask God. Okay? Because if that were to happen in front of my house and my daughter were living in my house, I don't care what age. I'm not handing her out, okay? So that's, that. We'll set that to the side. That's a question we'll talk with God. We'll have a group talk with God <laughs> when we get up to heaven, okay? And so the, the people are starting to get angry. They're saying, hey, look at this guy. He's not even among us. He's a sojourner, and he's trying to give us orders. Get the sojourner! And the, the angels step out, flash of light. They grab Lot, bring him back in. The men are blind. They can't find themselves around. And so Lot... They tell Lot, we're going to destroy the city, and it's just because of this kind of thing that we're going to destroy the city. And Lot says, okay, well, me and my wife and my three daughters, um, and, well, let me get their husbands, and ultimately what it comes down to, there's not enough righteous people in the city to save the city. Okay? We call homosexual sexual relations sodomite because of this story. Okay? And God destroyed that city. Now, understand one thing. It wasn't just because of the homosexuality of the cities that God destroyed them. Okay? And we'll see this a little bit further down in another scripture. Okay? Because all the scripture is built one on top of another. Precept on precept. Okay? So we see that God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding villages. Uh, Leviticus 18.22 uh, says that a man shall not sleep with a man as he would a woman. Uh, Leviticus 20.13, the same thing, says that their lives will be required of them if they commit this sin. 
uh, I want to jump ahead to Romans chapter 1, because here really is the understanding of what's going on with homosexuality. Now, I told you um, when we started talking about this that, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, chapter 1, I'm going to pick up uh, in verse 18, and then we're going to read down for a ways. Um, the relevant verses are up there, but I want to give you some background here. So, Paul is writing to the Romans, the Christians in Rome, um, which was a very immoral city. Okay? And he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Okay, so when people come to me and they say, well, you know, what about the Bushmen in Africa? They've never heard the gospel. Um, God addresses that right here. His very creation is a testimony to a creator. Okay? So he goes through, and, and he says they are without excuse. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Now think about this just for a moment as we back up and we think about Genesis chapter 1. The order of creation, we go through and, and day 5 we have the fish in the sea and the birds in the air and on day 6 we have all the creeping things on the land and, and then man and then man is given dominion over all of the created things, right? Right? God put him in charge of it. What does man do in his foolish thinking? He takes a thing that he is supposed to be the steward of and the husband of, and he bows himself down to it. Now, isn't that foolish thinking? That which he is supposed to be the master of, the caretaker of, he bows himself down to and worships. Look in 24. Therefore, because they did all of these things, we call that the downward spiral of moral depravity. They knew God. They ignored him. They um, didn't honor him or give him thanks. Their thinking was futile. Their hearts were darkened. Uh, they claimed wisdom but became fools. Uh, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images re resembling created things. Verse 24, therefore, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 26. For this reason. What's the reason? Because God has abandoned God and rejected God and become futile in his thinking such that the thing that he is supposed to rule over and take care of, all of a sudden he exalts it above himself and worships the, the creation. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And you go, well, what relations? Well, he's explaining, this is all one thought. 27, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women, and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Okay? Now, um, Two more passages I want to read real quick, and then I want to really get something pounded into your head. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9.
Okay, Paul has just come out of talking about the lawsuits among believers, and he's continuing this thought. He says, or do you know, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And now here comes the list. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Did you, did you pick that up? Okay. Real quick, I want to flip one more passage here. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1. And then I want to show you just one thing and we'll wrap up for today. Verse 8, Paul is writing to Timothy. And he says, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, with which I have been entrusted. Now, we've seen in, in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, and in, in Timothy, 1 Timothy, there's a specific mention to homosexuality and, and how we go from being a righteous nation to a, a nation that embraces homosexuality, that downward spiral. And, and then we see that, that those that practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the one thing I really want to show you is they are one among many. Those who strike their parents, those who are sexually immoral, murderers, liars, perjurers. See, the, the thing is, homosexuality is a sin. And Christ went to the cross to provide an escape for sin. All sin. Not just the ones that are acceptable. Not, not just the ones that we think are light or we can poo-poo. He went to the cross for all sin. Amen. And so when we come across somebody that is struggling with homosexuality, there's two things that we cannot do. The first thing that we cannot do is we cannot make light of their sin. Neither can we make light of anyone's sin. There is no accommodation between the light and the dark. Because where there is light, there is no dark. Okay, you can't have them both. It's either light or it's dark. The other thing that we can't do is we can't treat them as though they are not worthy of the grace that we ourselves have received. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because I was blind, I was lost, and he saved me, he found me, he gave me eyes to see and ears to hear, he took away from me my heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh, he gave me his Holy Spirit that I might understand his word, that I might learn to recognize between those things that God desires and those things that he detests. And if God was willing to pull me out of my special part of the pit, and he was willing to pull you out of your special part of the pit, The sacrifice of his son is proof positive that he is willing to pull them out of their part of the pit. It's like playing in a pen, pig pen, playing in the slot, and you come out and you point your finger at the person that was on a different part of the pit and say, look how dirty and filthy they are, all the while neglecting to realize that you also are covered in mud and slime. Okay? We speak the truth, we speak the truth in love. Our goal, our objective, is that they might be saved, that they might come to know the love of the Father. Okay? And when we stand in judgment on them, what does Scripture say uh, in James? It says, you, who are you to judge? Don't you know that there's only one judge and one lawgiver? We, all we're called to do is, is to determine what's fruit. Is this fruit or is it thorns? 
Is, is this grapes or, or is this stickers? Okay? And then our task is where we find that there is not fruit, that we would start sowing the word of God and bringing the love of God in, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is rooted in God's love for us, because being at one time perfectly just and being at the same time perfectly full of love, he met both of those on the cross that the one might be fulfilled because of the other. And so when we deal with people that are, that are caught up in homosexuality, we're dealing with people that are caught in sin. Just like the person that lies, just like the person that cheats, just like the person that whatever other sin it might be, uh, just like the person that dishonors their parents, okay? just like the person that eats too much. Okay? They're all caught in sin, and the only way out of it is the cross. Okay?